Welcome to the Inspire Health Podcast. Your life is about to get a whole lot better. Have you ever felt like you tried everything and yet still couldn't find the answers or the solutions that you were seeking? Whether you're dealing with chronic illness, physical or emotional pain, I want you to know that your body is the most sophisticated machine on planet Earth. Your body holds unfathomable wisdom. Trust in it and learn from it. Know that there are answers and there are solutions to your specific health challenges. And we will be uncovering all of them here on the Inspire Health Podcast. I'm so excited to be a part of your healing journey. Your transformation starts now. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Inspire Health Podcast. Today's guest is Master Polly Zink. Polly was privately trained for 10 years by a Kung Fu master. Polly studied Taoist alchemy theory and observed animals on his own initiative, independent of his master's teachings. Polly developed alchemy and numerous yoga postures, variations of postures, movements, and meditations, and created his own style he calls the art of yin yoga. Polly, it's an absolute honor to have you here on the show today. Thank you for having me, Jason. My pleasure. And I think your wife, too, Marie, is here as well. So we might hear her once in a while, too. Yeah, Hi, here. Marie. <laughs> Hi. This is my wife, Maria, and she's the backbone of the Yin Yoga Institute. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm really excited to talk to you, Polly, because from my perspective, at least what I was familiar with from my world of seeing yin yoga, it's very different from what I understand as being the original foundation of the art of yin yoga. So I really wanted to make sure that I got your perspective out because I feel like that's where it all started. Now, Polly, can you give me a little bit of background on how you even arrived at creating the art of yin yoga. And I think your, your background starts more with Kung Fu and martial arts. So if you can share a little bit about that, I'd love to hear. Yes, I, I would. It, it actually didn't start with martial arts. I was, uh, I was lucky enough to have been born into Hollywood. So <laughs> as a kid, I was on Hollywood Boulevard all the time. We lived right there at Hollywood and Western, so I'd walk up the boulevard. And in the 60s, it was fantastic living there because it was all kinds of street artists, performers. And that's where I learned, uh, had an interest in yoga because I'd see people doing yoga postures along the boulevard there. And uh, my dad would take me into the Zen tea houses for green tea in the afternoons. And then as a, before my teens, at 14, I started to really get interested in Hatha yoga from seeing it on the boulevard. So I, I turned on television and just started watching Richard Hittleman's Yoga for Health. And I stayed with that for years. I just kept at it. And uh, my mother wanted me to quit doing it. She thought yoga was weird. And so I, I, we had a lot of fights about it. But I stayed with it, and then uh, I loved it. And when I went to college, uh, I finally was doing it on the lawn there with a friend, showing them some postures. And this Chinese man kept watching and laughing. And one day he walked up and said, oh, you're doing this crummy. So <laughs> then he started to show me a posture or two each day. No, that was the yoga oh. stuff I was doing. I was showing a Tai Chi friend of mine there at the college how to do some stretches. Um, and so he just came up and started showing me some of the postures. And uh, that went on for a semester. And then finally he said, oh, I'm just gonna come to your house and start teaching you at night. So after, after uh, the day ended, he'd come to the house and uh, started showing me martial arts in addition. And so he was teaching me Kung Fu at the same time he was showing me yoga, Qigong. It was actually called Qigong. Hmm. And uh, Taoist yoga is what some people call Qigong. And so that's how I started out with it. As I had a little interest in uh, martial arts when I was about 16 too. So I went to a couple commercial studios and did a little bit of Kung Fu off and on. I primarily, though, stayed with my yoga because that was what I really loved. 
But then when the, I met my teacher, he started to say, well, I want you to learn this kind of martial art. So he didn't even tell me what type it was. He just started showing me movements. And uh, in addition, he said the foundation was Qigong. You have to be very flexible and be able to move your chi and your energy in the body first as a foundation to do the martial arts. So the healing art of it, the qigong part, is what I really loved. And uh, so I stayed with that. And uh, eventually when he showed me like one posture of say an animal, a frog for example, uh, I would go and study my own pets. I had frogs and toads as pets. So I would start studying movements based on them and start doing a lot of the postures by learning from the actual animals. Wonderful. So what were some of the primary influencers then for you to gradually develop your own style of, of the art of yin yoga? It sounds like you were immersed in yoga and then you incorporated the teachings from Kung Fu. And I think you did Kung Fu pretty extensively for a decade or so. Yeah, my, my uh, influences were when I met my teacher because I was doing the uh, Hatha yoga style from Richard Hittleman and then I got a book on Shivananda and was studying from that, the pictures in the book and doing the postures. But when I met my teacher, he started to teach me the Chinese philosophy of Taoism and everything is a different way of looking at things with the Chinese version versus the East Indian version. So he was a big influence on me as far as teaching me how to think the Chinese way. And then the postures that I did learn from Hatha, I changed them to be fitting to the Taoist way of doing something. So the way I do say the downward dog posture would be different than you're used to seeing it done in the Hatha style. So I still will teach those postures that I did learn. But the uh, actual influences for me have been studying all the different animals along with the five elements. And that's how I really uh, put together the art or came up with the art. The art really just flew fr flows right out of my heart when I practice it at night, usually. I wanna... And he was teaching me that. Nice. And we'll get into all of that in just a moment here. Now, you had mentioned, because um, that was fascinating, that the style for the art of yin yoga was influenced primarily from a Chinese Taoist perspective as opposed to more of a, um, as, as opposed to an Ayurvedic lineage. Right. Which is really quite interesting. I, I remember um, I, I started martial arts when I was about 12 years old, long pack long time back and my style was was karate and i remember going to japan when i was about 18 or 19 and studying with the master of our style in japan and we were sitting there one day at dinner and we were watching one of the older kung fu movies and he looked over at us and he said our style of karate which was known as chitorayu he goes the the knowledge of chitorayu he goes would fill this thimble and he said, karate, he goes, would fill this bowl. And he said, kung fu fills this whole room. <laughs> <laughs> so the, which I think is really great is that you got connected to something that is so steeped in tradition and wisdom at an early age that it sounds like you got to make a lot of neat connections with that. So when you had mentioned the Taoist way of doing certain things, like, for example, downward dog, how would that be different when you're taking it from a Taoist approach as opposed to more of an Ayurvedic approach to do a posture like downward dog? It means that you would become the dog by doing the beginning of the posture. You would be doing something that's called the full dog posture. And that's where you're on your hands and feet like a dog is. 
and then you would actually feel the energetics of an animal, of a dog. You try to actually embody and become what you're doing. And uh, it's not like I'm standing on a mat and I'm looking down and just bending into a posture and they're calling it the downward dog. Yeah, with the Taoist method of doing it, uh, you want to really become what you're doing by feeling it and not imitating, but really feeling it and becoming. This has been a theme that has come up in several interviews the last while, not particularly in yoga, but in the Mind, Body, Spirit Healing series that I recently did prior to this series. Mm -hmm. And it is this movement from getting away from just intellectualizing and head heavy and really starting to embrace sensation within the body. So mm -hmm. it sounds like that concept is then what segued into you developing this style. So now you said one of your greatest influences was looking at the animals themselves. So how do you go from watching an animal to then starting the process on really literally becoming that animal within your body and your individual expression of what that means. And the way that's done is it's a form of a meditation. <clears throat> it's a Taoist form of meditation. But what it is, is you, you have to really be with the animals or you could watch them on a nature show and see them. But what you have to do is come out of your thinking mind completely no thought and when you're just looking and feeling and experiencing it and bringing it into you you keep working with that and eventually you're able to say see a bug and become the bug a fly whatever you're looking at you if you're thinking i'm going to do this and, and imitate a fly or be like a fly doing this then what you're doing is you're still thinking the real secret to this is you have to come out of the thinking mind completely it's all about feeling through the intuitive heart and it's feeling without thinking which is extremely hard for a lot of westerners to do because there's always the thoughts keep coming in mm -hmm. and uh but what I've done was I used to go for several years to the zoo with the animals and I would just uh, sit with the mandrels and the baboons especially and feed them peanuts. And I got to where I'd hold their hands and they'd reach out and touch me and stuff. And I got to really know some of the big mandrels there. And uh, that's how I learned it though, by, by not thinking and just being present with them. And that helps a lot. And you could do the same thing if you have a beetle on your floor, or you could have a bug, or you could have a, a pet dog, especially a lot of people with their dogs or pets. And they can actually not think and have this kind of connection where they're really connected as one. Nice. And is that when you speak of it as being an art? Because I haven't heard most most forms of yoga aren't described as being an art, even though I think there's an aspect of that to them. But is the art the concept that it is probably going to be particularly different from person to person? It is. That's the reason it's an art form. And the reason is, is because I tell my students, if you're doing it the way I'm doing it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and that's because I want everybody to be able to learn. It's like learning the notes and music. When I show them postures that are fundamentals, those are like the notes. But with the notes, I want them to be able to flow differently. Everybody's going to flow differently because their energetics and the body are different. You're, one day your energetics would be a difference from the next day. So one day I'll hold a posture for a few seconds or another day I'll hold it longer. But each person will have their own individual self-expression that will come out when they're doing it. And that's what I want to see. I, I encourage it. So I'm saying that when you're doing it with me, I'm showing you fundamentally how to do it, a posture. Uh, but I don't expect it to be exactly the same as me because if you're imitating your teacher, then all you're doing is keeping his art alive for him. 
if it's an art form like that I'm teaching you, I want you to be able to have freedom of expression with it. Hmm. So you don't have to necessarily do the same pattern or, or say I gave you a uh, flow to do. You can do the flow to learn it, but you can also change it and alter it. And when you do that with your own, you bring your own artistic self-expression forth, and that's what I consider good. And is that's what I want to see. Is that the underlying goal for the Art of Yin Yoga? What would be the overall intent or goal for the Art of Yin Yoga for somebody? For, for the, you mean what the purpose of Yin Yoga is? That's correct, the purpose. The purpose of Yin Yoga is to help yourself heal and regenerate your body and grow back to what you lost as a child. So when you age, there's something called the metal energy endowing the body. And what happens is when people, they say when people get older, they keep getting stiffer and tighter. And that's just because energetically metal endows the body by contracting it as you age. That's only the theory. If in practice you do something to counteract the theory, um, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be true. At 90, you could still do the splits or all the hard postures. It's just a matter of continuing to practice and grow. So the, the goal, well, the, the actual purpose of yin yoga is to help, help you heal and regenerate the body and grow back to your normal ability of mobility and flexibility so that you can move naturally and flow again. And we are a monkey. Our body is the body of a monkey, a primate's body. And so if you've ever looked at the, the monkeys and the apes, as they get older and older, they're still very mobile and flexible. They move around perfectly until they just die of old age. But uh, it's not like in our culture where people are sitting in chairs, tightening up and getting stiffer and stiffer. And they're saying, oh, this is normal. When we're aging, we're getting worse. But that's the mind. Uh, yoga is 90% mind. Mm -hmm. So when you have the mindset that you're growing and getting better, if, some t if a teacher is teaching you how to grow and flow, then that will happen. And flow is important because it's not just about doing postures for nothing. It's about doing them so you can grow again and re regain your mobility. And, and that happen, when that happens, you develop your what's called chi, so qigong. It's really a form of qigong, but all yoga is a form of qigong. All it means is working your life force. And qigong that my teacher taught me is so different because when I learn like one posture from an animal, then I'll elaborate and study animals and do a dozen more postures. And that's how I started to develop it over the years of doing it. And the idea is that when you grow, you will flow and that will restore you again back to normal. Because we, we should always be able to be mobile and move around well. Nice. And I, I was actually just reading something a while back by um, the founder of a therapy called Bioenergetics, um, Alexander Lowen. And one of the key things that he was talking about was that you, without self-expression, then your capacity for pleasure, satisfaction in and energy is greatly dampened. Mm -hmm. And it sounds yeah. like in your practice, one of the focuses is on the ability for self-expression, whatever that individual, whatever that individual looks like doing it. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I think inherent within being able to fully express oneself, that makes sense that it would increase our capacity for creating chi and moving chi and moving it throughout our bodies. Yes, chi's moved. Uh, as your body gets loosened up more, your chi will flow more because the more you're open, the joints are all locked up with blockages. As they open up, your energy will flow much more. And the idea with it, 
is that it's a form of qigong, but it's not like what most people call qigong, because um, I still teach some people just standing and breathing meditations that most people think are the qigong. But real qigong just means working your life force and bringing your qi more powerful. So when I'm doing all the different animal postures, uh, that's how I developed my own form of the qi flow through the postures of the animals, um, which you've seen in some of the yin postures that are like, they'll do one called caterpillar or the cross-legged frog, which they call the uh, shoelace posture, some people. When I taught it though, it's the cross-legged frog because it's based on a series of frog movements and flows. Mm -hmm. But no matter what you call the posture by name, it's still the posture. Like in East India, it's the cow posture when they're sitting there. But I learned it in Hatha that way, but then when I put it together with my frog flows, that's how I, you know, that's how I really name postures. It depends what animal I'm doing, whether it's the butterfly, dragonfly, you know, the lion, whatever it's going to be, it will have it. It will actually embody that animal so that everybody can see what it is really. And when you take on the energies of the animals, that helps you get your chi to amplify. Interesting. Due to your primal nature, and that's important to make that point. Right. In yoga. It reawakens you to your primal. It brings forth your primal self. Mm -hmm. And the way that, and when the primal self comes forth, that's a lot of power and a lot of energy. And when when you are able to bring it forth, that's what the monkeys and the apes all have the ability to do. They naturally have that primal energy that comes forth. And that's because they are not thinking, but they're doing. It's all through the practice of a, it's like a, when you do the classes, they're like a practice that will help you bring it forth. Mm. If you're not thinking in the mind. Right. Yeah, I like that. And you had also mentioned that one of the other primary influences was the elements. The elements so, are all, yes. How do you weave the elements? What are the elements and how do they get weaved into the postures? What does that look like? In, in the art or in, in the Taoist philosophy and art of it, the elements are earth energy, metal energy, water energy, wood energy and fire energy they're called the five transforming energies the five elements and they're automatically weaved in to all of the postures because each of the animals embody a certain amount of one of the elements they're inseparable the five elements there's something that you can't really look at and say they're in they're separated you know um just like yin yoga Yin can't be yin without yang because they can't come up. Yin and yang are one, just like the five energies are called one. It's oneness with everything around us. We're connected to everything and inseparable. So that inseparability is the way it's looked at. Um, the five energies, though, mean that predominantly you might be metal, like we talked about when somebody ages and gets tighter and becomes more metal, like a robot. That means they're mostly metal energy, but they still contain the other four because you can't separate the other four out. One can't exist without the other five. Four. I mean the other four, right. Otherwise, you couldn't, it wouldn't be whole. Like yin and yang, if you took one part away completely, we would see the mountains out there with the tops with no bases, and we'd see people with fronts and no backs. So you, yin and yang has to be connect, connected as one. They can't be separated, but when they say yin, they're saying predominantly softer. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what? a little bit about the, the qualities of each of the elements the qualities of each of the five elements are are this earth is considered our mother element it's always at our feet so earth is a is a constant unchanging energy that's like our gravity if we relax and we fall to the ground right so earth's like absorbing like a sponge pulling us the gravity it doesn't change energetically it stays 
constant, always. The metal energy is an energy of hardness, tightness, contracting energy. Um, you'll turn to metal energy when you go out in the in like 20 below zero with your shirt on like this, you'll go outside and you'll start to feel yourself tightening up and contracting and freezing. Metal energy is like stopping. What metal means is stop, start, stop, start. So metal is like when you have water that freezes to ice. Ice becomes energized with what's called metal energy, which means solidified solid. And so stop and start because then from that metal element of the snow, it will melt and go back to water. So you've got earth, metal, then water energy is very soft and flowing. And there's, I'll give you, this is kind of a simple version of it because there's also a yin and yang of each of these five elements, but I'm just giving you the simple version. So water is flowing. And, and it can be calm or it can be powerful, but water is soft and flowing, and that gives birth to what's called wood energy. And wood energy is like a spring. So if you can imagine taking a green tree and bending the branch and letting go, it snaps, like a, a bow would with a bow and arrow, how you can pull the wood and let it snap. It's like a spring. So that means expansion. The wood means expanding. And when you go from wood element and give birth to the next one, fire, fire is the ungrounded energy. So it's the opposite of being grounded to the earth. It's rising and floating and light. So fire is if you heat up your body or you're jumping from the ground up, leaping. When you're going to jump, you have to be very light. And you can't feel like I'm going to be grounded like a cow now right here walking. But instead, you come up on the balls of the feet and you feel really light. And you bring your chi from the low point, which is called Dantian, below the navel. You take all your energy and you lift it up way up high in the chest and out the arms and hands as you jump. And you cl then you'll see your, if you're looking up and you're jumping up, you'll go much higher than if you're looking down trying to be grounded. So fire means ungrounded energy, rising energy off the earth. And then from that wave, it's like a wave that goes right up to the sky and then it drops back and returns to the earth again. So fire returns to the earth and then the cycle will start all over again. And uh, the directions, there's the five directions, the five elements. And they, that's how uh, it's taught in the Taoist way of doing the uh, postures. They're all based on the elements and the animals. Mm -hmm. And the animals, like you were asking about how they're interwoven, it's really not separating. But like if I teach students, I might say, let's do a tree posture or let's do a turtle posture where it's just swimming turtle of water. But in reality, like I said, the four elements still have to be with every element. So out of the five, whichever one you pick, you'll pick fire, you still got the other four elements there. And they're part of the animals in their natural state. So like predominantly the deer may be there to teach us the water element. The flow of the water element comes from say the deer or the frog. And that's, predominantly what you do in, in the beginning stages. And then advanced students, they actually can do the fire frog, the metal frog. They can change that energetics because it's not absolute like the Western mind thinks everything's got to be one way or another. It's, it's the potential to do five different postures for every one of the animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really complete way of looking at it. And, and it makes a lot of sense. So even if it makes then, so even if you were going to do a posture that might be predominantly fire, for example, mm -hmm. but ultimately to get the full expression of that fire, it still has to have a certain amount of groundedness with earth or yes. flexibility with water to be able to get the full expression of that fire, it sounds like. That's right. And, and also with those postures, every student, like I said, is going to be a little different. 
-hmm. And some students I have that are very earthy and grounded, they have a harder time doing a fire posture. But they practice it, but that's why their expression of the fire will be like a very yin fire versus a very yang fire. So the five elements have something called the ten branches that are there, the ten. So from the five, there's the ten. And what that means is that each one of those elements can be yin or yang in that element. So let's say an example I can give everybody that's real easy is fire element, since we were talking about fire. If you have a candle there, that's called yin fire. And you can put your finger through the flame of that fire easy, right? Now, if it's the blowtorch with yang fire, <laughs> you can't. Your finger would just disappear. So yin and yang of the fire, is that's one example, but every one of those elements has a yin and a yang aspect to it. Like wood, wood element is normally for what we practice, for health, it's always green wood, like the forest. But yet, if we say let's do yang wood, that would be petrified wood. So there's the hardest and the softest. Right, you got both big extremes on all of those even. And also the hardest will become the softest and the softest may become the hardest. There's that pulsation that goes back and forth. So when you do a posture and you become as hard as you possibly can be in that posture till you can't hold it anymore, all of a sudden you have to let go and relax and be as soft as you possibly can be. And that's the, that's the, the ebb and flow of it. So that's why a hard and a soft is the balance. Yin and yang, when you practice, should be balanced between the two so that you're, you're working to have strength to be able to flow naturally again, like an animal has tremendous strength and chi. And when you have that combined with softness and hardness, that's how you can move naturally. Mm -hmm. For movement, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Polly, how did it change so much? Because the type of yin yoga that you're describing is much more fluid and, and it feels alive and it feels like it's, it's um, this form of self-expression. And I, I would say most of the time when, if I go to a studio around here that does a yin yoga practice, yin yoga seems to be sitting in postures, static pos postures for three to 10 minutes a lot of times. And it seems so different from where its original roots seem to have come from. Yeah, so that's because in the early days, I think I mentioned it at the beginning when I was teaching the muscle builders and the, and the martial arts guys, they were very stiff. So I would put them in a posture, have them hold it for, I wouldn't use a timer, but I'd say hold this as long as we can. So they'll hold it a couple minutes or so. Then they change to the next posture. I give them something else to work on. And when I was doing that at that time, there, there have been, uh, there was a student that would go out and popularize it then, teaching it that way. And so it became popularized by doing it really simple and maybe only at maybe 20 movements they might have you do possibly. And that's why it's, be, it, they were, teaching it as a supplement to other forms of yoga too. Well, he was a beginner level student. He only learned the beginning portion a of begin practice. At the beginning when I was teaching people, I wouldn't teach them too much about the elements, the animals, or the art of it because they weren't able to really use it. At that time, I was teaching a little bit more traditional like my teacher did, taught me. And he said, don't teach anything to the unworthy students that come to you. Just teach basic fundamentals. Unless somebody proves they're a loyal student, don't show them anything. So at that time, even if I wanted to show everything, I couldn't have because people were just unable to do it. You know, they can't really do it, so they have to just learn real easy, like babies things, you know, simple things. And at that time, that's how I was teaching everybody. You're going to just sit here and hold this posture and because they were so stiff and tight. That's, and that's what became popularized all over the world today. 
That's and, fascinating because it, um, and, and I guess it makes sense, especially Western society, I would say most men particularly, but people in general are not moving as much as they should and usually very stiff. So it sounds like that would be the first step in being able basically to prep yourself to even be able to do all the next levels and all of the other benefits that can come from the art of yin yoga. It is, yeah. It's like giving a, a guitar to somebody and say, play it, and they don't know what to do with it. So you have to show them like very easy fundamental steps, you know. They'd have to learn the chords and just learn what the notes are. And that's what, what uh, some of the people were doing. They would learn from me there, but then they'd go out and start practicing it and teaching it. And so it's, it's a good start for people. But a lot of people think that's what the whole art is. And then when they see me do things, it's done differently than they're being taught. And that's because without the elements and the animal energetics combining with it, it's not complete. It's just like, here's a fundamental posture and just do this posture and I'll time you, they're saying. And mm -hmm. uh, that actually goes against a lot of times when they're teaching it nowadays, they're not really teaching my philosophy because the Taoist philosophy that I taught with was different. Um, I don't really believe in rigidly having everybody sit there for the same amount of time. If I put 20 people in a posture, I expect them to move around and change postures at their own pace. I'd say change at your own pace. Because uh, mm -hmm. otherwise, it's not Taoist. It's very rigid then. And, and you know, mechanistic. yeah, mechanistic. See, the whole thing about the art is it's organic. We're an organic organism. We're not a mechanism. But a lot of people today think we are, we're a mechanism and they teach with a mechanistic method using a timer, saying everybody has to be exactly the same here, like a machine. And right. that way would be, I tell students who tell me that's what they are used to, I say that would be for somebody to go to the army and be a Marine. You know, you want to be really regimented like that. That's too much. But the way I taught was serious in those days. But I still would say, hold as long as you can, but when you have to, come out and change. So they'd be changing postures. Yeah, I think that's fascinating, though. It just makes me think that what people often think of as yin yoga is only the very first step of yin yoga and, and a very limited amount of, I mean, because the goal of the art of yin yoga is for health and wellness and vitality yes, and self-expression. So the part that I think most people are aware of of yin yoga almost in my mind thinks it's the prep you have to do before you can even venture into all the levels where I think you get the vast majority of the health benefits from. Yes, you have to get the fundamentals, at least be able to you know, grow enough flexibility to do standard, just basic uh, beginner level yoga. Mm -hmm. So it makes and, me think anybody that's gotten to the point in yin yoga where they've gotten some flexibility and they're feeling more comfortable than that needs to go and take your courses to figure out what the other levels are because there's yeah. probably a world they're missing that they're not aware of yet. Yes, in the classes that you're taking commercially, they don't really teach you the elements, the animals of the flow. Mm -hmm. And then there's another thing that's missing in, in a lot of it today is that What's to me more important than the posture is the transition from posture to posture. The unseen transition is very important. And that's how you would go from one posture to the next posture. Hmm. And to me, that's more important, but it should be at least as important as the posture itself. Because that's about your ability to naturally flow and move again. Restoring your ability to flow and move as you did as a child. And I've had people start my classes in their 70s and by 76, they were better than most of the young yoga women in the, in the teaching, in the classes. And so they, if a person really has the right mindset though and willing to practice, that's what it takes. Nice. 
Holly, one thing that I had read in an article you had was you talked about wanting to flow and open up to an intuitive form of self-expression that was true to you. I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about what intuition means to you and how, how that's developed over the years. That is something called the monkey mind. And what that is, it's not what the Buddhist people talk about, monkey mind. Monkey mind in the Taoist traditions, um, what my teacher taught me as far as the fundamentals of the basics for the healing arts, they come from the cave shaman that were healing people. And what the monkey mind meant in, in Taoist teachings is that you empty your mind of all thoughts completely and you become part of your environment by feeling everything around you we're not separated but we're all part of everything and oneness around us and when you can empty the mind completely out and just feel what you're doing through the intuitive heart and as you do that you may be there one time and nothing's happening and another time it just flows right through you so that's what the artistic part of self-expression is. It's like the way a person will write a book at night or they'll paint a painting at night. Somebody will be up and just do this marvelous painting. But it's not something you can expect to happen every day. It's just going to happen when it happens. You can't force it either. So you'll work, you'll work your fundamentals that I've been showing students how to work the fundamental postures. but I will work them and work them and work them for a week or two weeks. And then all of a sudden I've got something, something will flow right from me then artistically where I'll take a certain movement of a certain animal or a bug and I'll work with it, but nothing's happening. And eventually there will be something that will come from that, which will be opening to a creative flow that comes from the universe. It's a creativity that will flow through you that you can't control it and say, I want it now, this minute. But it will happen with you when you practice it. But it only will happen when you stop thinking and bring that primal self forth to be able to be open to that kind of universal knowledge. When so, you open to that creativity, though, it, it sometimes will happen like a flow where you just stay with that. Keeps going, going, going for a, a time. So what are some of the ways for people to better connect or how do you facilitate that spontaneous flow of energy and movement and creativity in your trainings? It, it seems to me that one of the setbacks for so many people is because they are so much in their thinking mind and they often a lot of people are really self-conscious even of how they move how do you how do you start the process to get people to even be in a place where they can authentically connect to that type of spontaneous energy that you're speaking about what i usually do with my students in the classes is have them Try. I, I get them having fun with what they're doing. I'll try to see what the class is able to do first as I watch them. And then I, I see what kind of energetics that each person in the class has. I'll notice what the group energy is. And what I do then is I try to encourage them to have fun with it. So I'll have them playing and laughing and having a lot of fun with what they're doing. So my classes can be loud and fun. And I, I encourage people. And what actually helps a lot is when you're doing animal energetics. Because I'll, have, I'll be showing them how to make the animal sounds with the postures. And so they'll be doing postures and laughing and having fun. And uh, like the seal posture, they'll be doing the sounds and everything. And they'll be moving with it. When you're moving with it, you're having fun too. Whereas if you're just sitting still meditating or holding a posture, trying to learn to grow into it, it tends to be quieter. And maybe people are, you know, inhibited a little bit. 
So they tend to not, they're more shy. But what I try to do is encourage everybody to laugh and have fun and play with it. I tell them it should be more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> well, and if part of your goal is to have people become more childlike in that regard, then play is probably one of the best ways to, to get there. And I try to do that. I, I, what I always want to do is get people to be playful when they're doing their yoga. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times I'll have, you know, workshops with a lot when as long as 90% of the people are with it, that's good. I'm very right. happy because I'm getting 90% happy. You can't make 100% happy always because there's always somebody that, you know, says, Oh, I rather this be restorative yoga, or I rather I don't want to have any fun, you're going to hear that now and then. But when I only get one or two in the group saying that, I don't feel bad at all. <laughs> because then they, they would rather be maybe in a more meditative type class than a restorative or something. Right. I, I, tra I tell my teachers that I train, though, that as long as you're doing 90%, that you're doing the most good for the most people then. Mm -hmm. Polly, how has your your art of yin yoga evolved over the years and, and is it continually still evolving evolving oh, it, it does like definitely it's a living art form mm -hmm. to me it's a living art so i am always developing new postures and new flows constantly are being developed and uh, i'll have somebody ask me about a certain animal posture to do and what I'll say to them, well, that one I haven't seen, but I'll have to see it first. When I see it, I can do it. So then I have to go see it on a, one of them brought an iPad up and showed me this little animal moving. So then I, I said, now I can do it for you and show you how to do it. It's like a, a musician who can just hear something and play it. When you can see it and embody it, you can do it automatically. It's that easy. Once you get used to seeing it and doing it from watching animals, you just have to do it. But for if they say something like I haven't seen before, then I have to see it because I can't, can't really imagine something I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Or if they describe some kind of strange little bug, you know, they've seen. I have to see it. I, but once I see it, I can do it then. It, um, it makes me think that the postures that you incorporate because they're so intertwined with the animals and the elements that different postures would inherently be beneficial for even specific health conditions that people would suffer from yeah i think of them from a chinese medicine perspective we think of imbalances within the elements and because all the postures embody different degrees of different elements that those could be very balancing for a lot of different health conditions, I would imagine as well. They are, when I do the yoga classes or, or like a workshop, they'll be doing all the different animals that are all five different energies. And those will rebalance you naturally back to your state of health. But I taught for five years cancer patients, medical Qigong, and that was just really, teaching them five different animals to balance their energy back again. And those were what I used. And I would start off with the bear posture was for the earth element of the body. I'd have them grounding and doing the bear. And then from that one, they would give birth to the metal element. So I had them doing the, doing the white crane posture they were doing, which was for the metal energy, the lungs. Then from that position of the crane, I would take that to the wood element of the green dragon, and I would have them do the dragon postures for wood to, to help them. And when they went uh, from the metal element, white crane, I'd go to the water first before the dragon. But when I went into the water element, that was the deer. And the deer was for the kidneys and uh, water energy balancing. And then the wood I just mentioned. And then finally, we'd go to the fire, which was the monkey posture, which was fire monkey. And you could do phoenix or some other posture based on a, a fire element. But I'd pick the monkey, fire monkey, which was the monkey that climbs a tree and is ungrounded. 
So I'd have them up on the balls of their feet and moving around with the postures to help energy of fire go up. And then when I'd bring them back to bear, they'd drop the energy back down to the earth again and sink into the earth. And that rising and falling of the chi from up high to the low point would be a form of healing and re regenerating. Yeah, I think that also sounds like a lot of fun too. It was real fun and they loved it. And what was really good is when people were trying to heal from an, a serious ailment like cancer, mm -hmm. um, when they just have a lot of fun and happiness, they look forward to that class every week. And so that actually, I think, did help a lot. What about for specific emotions that people get stuck in? So whether someone has been dealing with grief uh, and loss, for example, that is more of an emotion that gets held with, say, the lung meridian. Those, those, those are all connected to the animals. So the animals, the elements, the emotions, they all are, they're all connected together. So out of those, what you could do to rebalance them is to either the yielding or the birthing cycle based on those elements can be used. So metal element can be used. You can melt the metal with fire energy for joy to bring joy there by melting the metal. Uh, but they're all connected. So the five elements, the five energies, five transforming energies are the same as the five elements. But the five emotions, they go, they all go together. The organs, the five, the organs in the body. Uh, in Chinese medicine and healing arts, it's the organs, the emotions, the el and also the animals all go with that. But they're all really not something that's looked at. To some people in the West, they're looked at as these separate things, you know, like the emotions. But in, in the masters in China, it's all really one thing. So your five energies, when you do the animals, you're healing the emotions too. Because mm -hmm. you yeah. can't really do one without the other separately. For an example, like say with the monkeys we were talking about, which was a fire energy. Uh, they say fire energy of a monkey because when people see the monkeys, they start to get happy and joyful they start to laugh, right? So if I give you all the postures and energetics of the monkey, that will happen for you. Mm -hmm. But if you were sick there in the hospital, and I brought a basket in and brought a monkey out of the basket, you'd see the person start to be happy. So you can change the emotion by practicing it, or you can change the emotion by seeing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So seeing it is also visually is very important right yeah and then and then gradually experiencing it inside your body yes once you see it you experience it but if you right. don't see it it's kind of hard to experience it with these kinds of meditations that you may get to do but for me they never really helped when i did the traditional meditations mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's just such a complete system. That's what I really like about it. There's so many layers to it. And even when you're practicing, you don't have to understand all of the different pieces, but know that there's a lot of other things going on that are benefiting you. Yes. Now, Polly, I want to be respectful of your time too. You've, you've been in this world of martial arts and yoga and and healthcare and all of these areas for a long time. Has there been any specific teachings or insights or awarenesses that you've come up with? I know you've had many, but has there been any that really jump out that really created a shift in the way you viewed things or had an aha moment that really shifted certain things in your life? It was when I met my teacher and, uh, I think the biggest shift I've had was when I met from doing my, my standard Hatha yoga and then meeting my teacher and learning from him his way of doing it. The biggest shift I found was that these aren't the ways I want to do something for myself as an art form. They kind of changed 
it changed when I started studying the animals and learning from the animals. That was my biggest, biggest thing that happened. Because my teacher said, everything I show you has to be done exactly like this or it's wrong. And so everything they show you, traditionally, it's only one right way to do it. Everything else is considered wrong. And so I had studied all the animals on my own for years. I was with my teacher for 10 years. He would come and teach me all the time privately. And uh, after 10 years, he'd always say, oh, you're fair. Oh, not so good, he'd say, crummy. <laughs> and then after just doing it, I wasn't expecting much, but one day I just showed him a whole flow I did on an animal. And he looked at me and said, oh, you're your own master. Whatever you do is perfect. And that just <laughs> came out of nowhere. <laughs> I, I love that. So by having a master, it actually allowed you to find the master within yourself. Yes, it did. Yeah. Wonderful. Polly, is there anything else before we finish up that you think is important to share to our audience? I think one thing that I also learned, and I, I tell my classes this too from time to time, but one thing that is really important is that you can, like my teacher taught me, he said, you have to do this, just do it, and he'd show you how to do it. But when I learned from him after 10 years, then he handed me a couple books and said, oh, if you want to know the theory, here it is. So the acupuncture books, the element theories are all in the books. <clears throat> but he said too, which was real important, it's more important to be able to do something and master it than it is to theorize about it. <clears throat> because the theory and the practice are two different things. So in reality, what I try to tell everybody is that you can really be a master of something and not really worry about the theory, but you can know all the theory and all the books and you may not be able to do anything with it because see, when you're thinking in theory and using that with a thought process, that again becomes a mechanistic way of thinking and doing. And the organic way to do it is to not think, but do very important and that's what's extremely hard for the western mind to grasp letting go of the thinking mind and just showing people i tell my students that are teaching it should be monkey see monkey do that's how you should be teaching your students by an example showing your students how it's done and when they see it they can get it that way some people need to hear it too visually and and also by hearing it some people are so in their head they need some type of uh, way of describing something to help them do it but when they see it and hear it that's important they can do it then wonderful Polly, that was wonderful i really appreciate your time and your expertise and your years of wisdom that you get to pass on to all of us. I look forward to seeing you at some point at one of your courses. I, my wife and I will definitely come see you at some point. Oh, I hope you come down, Jason. Yes, we look forward to it. So thank you very much for your time. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having him. All right, well, guys. That, that was awesome. awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to invest in your health and well-being. Since this podcast is brand new, reviews and subscribers are so vital for us to get off the ground and share this really important information. So if you found this information valuable, please post a review and subscribe to the podcast so you'll get our newest episodes. Also, if you know of someone who would benefit from this, please share it with them. You can also find us on Instagram at hashtag inspirehealthpodcast. If you have a question that you'd like to be addressed, direct message me on Instagram or leave a comment on one of my posts. I would love to hear from you. And you can grab our show notes and free resources for each episode at inspirehealthpodcast.com. So be sure to go online and check it out.